Hey there, friends. Welcome. Welcome on behalf of the Orchard Oxford to our Good Friday service. It's in this space and in this time that we remember 24 hours that would forever change the world. Jesus, God's son, grabs 12 of his closest friends. They are in the city of Jerusalem. The streets are packed, thousands upon thousands of people. There's this hustle and this bustle because for every faithful Jew, you are in the city to participate in one of the most highlighted festivals of all time, Passover. Passover. We remember the storyline of God's people being delivered long ago in the Old Testament from Egypt and a vicious Pharaoh. They will find solace tonight. Jesus and his closest friends in an upper room located on the southwest corner of Jerusalem. And as they walk into this room, it will get personal. On a low reclining table, dimly lit room, candles flickering, shadows casting upon the walls. The shadows will come out. Jesus, as he reclines with his friends, tells them, that many of you will betray or deny me. Jesus grabs a bowl and he gives the instruction that the one sitting at the seat of honor, well, the one who will eat from the bowl right before him, that person by the name of Judas will betray him. Every disciple wondered, could it be them? Is it I, Lord, is it I? Echo upon echo, but it is revealed that Judas is the one, but he's not the only one. One of Jesus' closest friends, Peter, will deny him three times before the sun comes up. Every one of them will leave him stranded and alone in some way, shape, or form. It's personal at this table. With a tension so thick you could cut it with a knife, it's awkward. Now, while that it's personal, it's also predictable Every one of these men are Jewish. They know the predictability of the Passover meal in script. They could perform this meal in their sleep. They will take at this table tonight bitter herbs and salt and vinegar, reminding them of the bitter years of slavery in Egypt. They will also eat of flat, yeastless cakes that remind them that they must grab them. They're in a hurry. They have to get out of Egypt. And they will take a Passover lamb, reminding them of blood that was shed, put on the doorpost and all around, saying, God, will you deliver us? But that which is predictable, Jesus will completely flip the script. He will add a new element to the meal tonight, an element that will be completely prophetic. Jesus will grab some bread at the table And he will take the bread and he will break it. And he will say, this is my body, which will soon be broken for you. Following that, Jesus will take a cup. He'll hold it high and he'll bless it. And he'll say, this cup symbolizes my blood. My blood that will soon to be shed, that will form a new covenant between God and his people. This blood, this cup, will bring about the forgiveness of many sins. At the table, it's personal. At the table, it was predictable, but Jesus flips the script. It becomes prophetic. And it's in this moment, in the awkward silence at a low reclining table that God's kids, us, can see that heaven is preparing its Passover lamb to take away the sins of the world. When that meal is done, they will sing a song, a hymn together, and they will head to the Mount of Olives.
So Jesus and his disciples leave the place where they were eating, and they go to the Garden of Gethsemane. And as they're going, the disciples have to still be thinking about what Jesus had told them at dinner, that someone would betray him. What we see in the next verses is Jesus is thinking about it too. He says, it's not just that one of you will betray me, all of you will desert me. Can you imagine how alone Jesus feels in this moment? That he has to reveal to all his closest friends and devout followers that they will desert him, and even in just a few short hours. Jesus is already alone in the weight that he carries. And he finds his way to the garden. As he makes his way to the heart of the olive grove, the weight of the moment bears down on him. He stops to rest a forearm against a branch. For generations, the olive branch has been a, a symbol of peace. But not for tonight. Not for Jesus. There is no peace for Jesus to find in this moment. The disciples, they stop to rest, and, and Jesus moves on, and now alone, not just in his heart anymore, but in the clearing, he falls to his knees and then to the ground. Jesus was never more human than he is now, never more weak, never more sad, never more afraid. He clutches the grass as if to rein in the runaway terror. He writhes on the ground, his agony reflected in the twisted trunks of the onlooking trees. He claws the ground, hoping for its embrace, but there's none. There's only silence and darkness in the cold, hard ground. As the dark night falls upon his soul, he wrestles in prayer. His words are the shards of a broken heart, and they shred his soul on the way up. As he pushes his words into the night, his wrinkled brow wrings sweat from his face. And he looks, most, he looks least likely of all to be the one who will lead creation back to paradise. Eden's only hope lying in the dirt among so many fallen twigs. Finding his disciples fast asleep, Jesus comes to the faithful realization that this is a place where he must wrestle alone. Or he must sweat and pray alone. Abba, Father, his words are underscored with sobs. Everything is possible for you. Punctuated with long periods of silence. Take this cup from me. The Father's heart breaks over what he sees, what he hears. His only son groveling in the dirt, his own son crying in the dark like a lost little boy. Abba. And what father wouldn't want to answer a request like that? Yet not what I will, but what you will. His hands are no longer clutching the grass in despair. They are no longer clasped each other in prayer. They are raised towards heaven, reaching not for provision, or rescue or answers, but reaching for the cup from his Father's hand. And though it is a terrible cup, brimming with the wrath of God for the ferment of sin from centuries past and centuries yet to come, and though it is a cup that he fears, he takes it. He returns to his eleven dreaming disciples to see the one who would betray him coming up the hill. How often had Jesus seen his dear friend in the distance, and how often had he looked upon that sight with joy? Not tonight. There is no joy in their greeting kiss, only betrayal and deception. Jesus is arrested, grabbed, and treated like a criminal. Despite the desperation of the disciples and the calming spirit of Jesus to heal, he is led away like a sheep to its slaughter to go before the council. He's led to the house of a man named Caiaphas. And all of the teachers of the religious law and the rabbis were there. People who have plotted for years about how to catch him in his own words and how to put an end to his teachings. And in this place where the people with all of the knowledge of the law, there seems to be no law at all. They search for people to testify. They search for anything to convict him and put him to death. Jesus stands as an innocent man in a room full of people 
who desire to see him put to death. There are no friends in this place. His disciples have all scattered. Outside by the fire, the very man who swore to never betray him, Peter, denies that he even knows Jesus. Somewhere in the night, a rooster stretches its neck, shakes its feathers, and crows an indictment. The disciple jerks his head around and catches Jesus looking at him. The Savior utters no words, nor does he shake his head in disappointment or lower it in disgust. His look is not, I, I, I told you so. It is sympathetic from one who knows what it's like to be tempted. Jesus has been there too. For 40 days in a barren wilderness, he knows the struggle and he knows how ruthless the adversary can be. No, his look carries no grudge. It's the look of a friend who understands. And with that look, all of Peter's pent-up emotions suddenly cave in on themselves. He runs from the courtyard, bitter tears stinging his eyes. And he stops somewhere outside and beats his fist against his chest. The weight of his guilt is just too much to bear. He pleads with God to be given a second chance for his words to be taken back. But for Peter, this darkest of hours will not be taken from him. Instead, Jesus is taken to Pilate. Under Roman jurisdiction, executions by the ruling council were outlawed. But if found guilty under Roman law, he could be executed. What's more, the dirty work would fall to the hands of the military. Pilate is in the position of procurator of Judea, a job that he disdains. He has no respect for the Jews over whom he rules or for their beliefs or their convictions. He defers to them only when it serves him. But this particular Jew, this Jesus that stands before him now, then is an enigma. Jesus admits to the accusation against him that he is a king. And in the wake of silence created by that admission, Pilate circles Jesus, studying him. He looks nothing like a king. He's humble. He's downcast by betrayal and loneliness. He stands not as a king, but stoops more in humility as a servant would. And yet there's something about him that, that troubles Pilate. In keeping with holiday tradition, he offers them the release of any prisoner. And part of Pilate hopes that they choose Jesus. They do not. There is no hopeful voice. There is no kindness to be had from the crowd. The very same people who cheered for his arrival a week ago are the very smiles that have turned to anger against him. And again, the fateful choice falls to Pilate. He turns from the crowd, picking carefully through his alternatives, and he decides to have Jesus flogged. Maybe that'll satisfy him. Maybe they'll back down. So he gives the order. Jesus is taken away, and guards take his wrists, they tie them with a rope and cinch them to rings, and a whip is used to deliver the punishment. The weapon of choice that will scar the skin of the Savior. A tired man, not just physically, but emotionally and spiritually drained, Weary from the loss of sleep and lightheaded from the loss of blood, Jesus collapses. A voice in the crowd howls, strip him! And a few of the soldiers pounce and they pull Jesus to his feet, ripping the garment off his back. He stands naked before his enemies. A soldier drapes a, a, a red cape around his shoulders. Another soldier has taken a strand of thorns and woven it in a wreath. Mockingly stating, King's got to have a crown. He mashes the thorns onto Jesus' scalp. Jesus grimaces as God's curse on Eden comes back to curse him. Word comes to the guards that Pilate is ready for the prisoner. So they lead him back for the judgment, a judgment that Pilate is reluctant to make. He believes Jesus is innocent. Maybe a friend could be had in Pilate. Maybe Jesus would find the pity of this man in charge of his sentence. But he has to convince the crowds. Pilate brings Jesus in view of the crowds, hoping that the the pitiful sight will evoke some sense of mercy. Pilate announces, 
Here is the man, the one you want to crucify. Look at him now. Behold the face, behold the back, behold the blood and the bruises and the broken heart. Behold the God who became flesh and allowed this to be done to it. Here is your king. And with those words, Pilate says more than he knows. The crowds refuse not only to submit to the king, but to show him even a shred of mercy. Crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. The words ring in Pilate's ears as he pauses. He looks at Christ, he looks at the crowd, and he washes his hands in a feeble attempt to remove guilt or blame, and he walks away. Jesus is led up a hill through a crowded town full of people cheering for his death, shouting at him in mockery. He's led to a chalky knoll just outside of Jerusalem's northern wall, Scooped with shallow caverns, the rounded hill looks grim and ominous and well-fitted for its name, Golgotha, the place of the skull. And the skull stares away from the city, its, its stone gazed unmoved by the vultures and the crows pecking around for the remains of the dead. Three vert vertical beams are staked to the top of that hill, standing tall and unshaded in the morning sun. The soldier stretched Jesus' arms across the coarse grain wood. A soldier straddles his chest, two others straddle his arms, two others his legs. They're used to the fitful resistance of the condemned men. But this condemned man throws no fit. He offers no resistance. And with little fight, they drive a nail through his wrists. The men work to hoist the cross up. And once the cross beam is secure, Christ's right leg is pulled over the left, and a single nail is driven through both feet. His face winces to record how far the pain has traveled and how deep. He opens his eyes and sees a few soldiers milling around below. Father, forgive them. The three words impale them as forcefully as the three spikes they use to impale him. They all look up, transfixed, as Jesus finishes his prayer, for they do not know what they are doing. Not only does Jesus ask for his Father to forgive them, he offers a kind word on their behalf. The calloused ears of these soldiers have heard all kinds of words on that hill in every different language. They've never heard words like these, not once, not until now. And a chasm of silence opens between the men, an awkward moment for men used to loud talk and coarse language. And in the quiet of that moment, Jesus closes his eyes. We find ourselves on this night remembering the death of Jesus recounting the story of the last hours of our Savior's life. And in this story, we can see just how alone Jesus must have felt in these hours. From the Last Supper, where he told a room full of his closest friends what the next hours would hold, how alone he must have felt knowing that even these men, the ones with whom he had spent every day with for the past three years, would be gone and would have abandoned him for fear of their own lives to the garden where he prays alone, something that was not foreign to, to him and the practice of reconnecting with his father. But as he tries to connect, there's a break in the line. He is fully alone, wrestling with the coming hours and what is before him. He finds himself in a crowd of people with no friendly faces, no one to help him or care for him in his greatest time of need. In his darkest moment, where he needed it the most, there is no friend to help him carry his load. There is no one to come beside him and to help him. I've read this passage more times than I can remember. It's one that, while I'm familiar with it, it's one that never gets old and never loses its weight. But there is something about this passage that speaks differently this year, that hits me in a different place. 
this year because of where we find ourselves as a state and as a city. It's just how lonely this scene is for Jesus. For me, this past month has seemed like one of the longest and loneliest years of my life. I believe that's not just because I'm an extrovert. I believe that's because I'm a human. We aren't meant to be alone. We see that from the creation of mankind that it is not good for us to be alone. And we see Jesus in this passage commit himself into the hands of that very reality of being totally alone. He knows what this means. He knows that a holy God cannot be in the presence of any sin, and he knows what he is taking on and the weight and the burden of the sins of the world. He knows what this will do and what it will mean. He knows how bad it will hurt, and he does it anyway. He plunges headlong into the darkness and pain of loneliness. Why? So that we won't ever have to. Jesus knows what it means to feel alone. And he has died on the cross for our sins and to bring us back into right standing with God so that we will never have to feel alone again. Romans 5 tells us this. When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. For since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son while we were still his enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of his son. So now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends with God. We have been made friends of God. And no matter where you find yourself tonight, either surrounded by your family or by yourself in your house, know that you are not alone. God is with you and he desires to stay by your side. We have a God who can sympathize with us. He knows our position and he knows our hurts. And I pray you find a God tonight who knows your hurt and knows your pain in this time.